In the name of God who creates, redeems, and inspires us. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning to everybody. I'm Edie Weller. I've had the occasion to be here a couple of times um, earlier to um, celebrate liturgy with you, and I appreciate this opportunity to be back on this particularly beautiful day with sunlight streaming through the windows. It's a very nice uh, change to have. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is Jesus' response to the Samaritan woman early in their conversation at Jacob's well. It's one of the few encounters we have in Scripture of a long conversation between Jesus and another person. The story is rich in detail and in symbolism, and it invites us into our own conversation with Christ if we dare to take that step in faith. The particulars of the story are familiar to you as we just heard them, and we can be grateful to John the Evangelist for including them because they help us understand what a radical conversation this was not only the content of it, but the very fact that it was taking place. Jesus making his way back to Judea from from Judea to Galilee had taken this shorter route through Samaria, somewhat unexpected since Jews and Samaritans have been sworn enemies for some centuries. They considered, Jews considered the Samaritans, who actually were their distant relatives, to be tainted by intermarriage with foreigners. And the Samaritans, for their part, deeply resented the Jews' insistence that Jerusalem was the be-all and end-all, the center for worshiping God. All those feelings between them that say, you're not my kind, underlie this meeting of Jesus and the woman And added to all those religious and ethnic differences is the simple fact that he is a man and she is a woman. And in those days, those two don't speak to each other. And so, lest we forget, this was an extraordinary conversation. When he asked her for a drink, she's startled enough and brave enough to wonder out loud how it is that he would do such a thing, given everything that separates them, And he answers her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. If she knew the gift of God. Later in their talk, the woman declares with conviction that she knows the Messiah is coming, one coming from God to bring salvation we might wonder, what was her expectation of that? How did she envision Messiah? Would it be someone who would come and overturn the cruelty of Roman occupation? Someone to reunite Jews and Samaritans so that they might finally live and worship together? Someone to redeem her from that social stigma of her own life, that scandal of five husbands, which somehow Jesus already knew about, someone who can make it possible for her to rejoin the life of her community, someone, in short, who would bring peace to her people, her community, and even to herself. Well, whoever she imagined the Messiah might be, whether a warrior prince or a prince of peace, she was expecting him and waiting for him, hoping for a future day when he would finally arrive, God's gift to the world. And so, did she have any idea who this was who sat before her now beside this ancient well that was built by ancestors she shared with him? But how could she? After all, all she knew was that he was a Jewish man traveling the road who was tired and thirsty and asking for a drink. 
And yet she saw that he was willing to risk his own reputation by speaking to her across everything that divided them. And something about him gave her the courage to continue the conversation. He said, if she'd known, she would have asked him and would receive living water. Of course, she didn't get that. I mean, it didn't really make any sense. The entire context is upside down. He has no bucket and no obligation to serve her. And that phrase, living water, what's with that? Even if he simply meant fresh spring water, where was he going to get that from? And yet, as they dare to keep talking, something is opening up inside her, a glimpse of recognition, of new understanding, the possibility of something life-giving breaking through. She is changed by their talk. Her own imagining of Messiah and the purpose of his coming takes new shape as she actually encounters this man, Jesus. He offers her living water. What's so special about water, that most essential element of life, more precious than gold among a desert people? That image of life-giving water runs deeply through scripture. In our reading from Exodus a few minutes ago, we have the story of God's extraordinary gift of water from the rock given to thirsty Israelites who, in their fear and fatigue, can only demand, is the Lord with us or not? For some reason, even after their deliverance from Egypt and the provision of manna and quail earlier in their journey, they still ask, is the Lord here or not? As if the answer could be in any doubt at all. And yet even in the face of this kind of clumsy and temperamental challenge, God continues to give abundantly, bringing water from a rock so that they might have life and be able to continue on their way to the promised land. God asks for their trust and their faithfulness to the relationship. For if they ask in faith, they will receive in love. Elsewhere, Jeremiah speaks of God as a fountain of living water, that source of energy for all life. Isaiah describes God's blessing on Israel like water poured upon a thirsty land. Zechariah, Ezekiel, and Joel all share a potent vision of water flowing from the temple sanctuary with power to cleanse people of their sin and to nourish all creatures and bring forth abundant fruit and healing leaves from the trees lining the water, living water as a gift from God. If you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus' words to this unknown, unnamed woman at the well and the questions embedded in them are also meant for us on our own journey of faith as individuals and as a household of God and as an entire community of God. And the first question is this, do we ourselves know the gift of God. That promise of life-giving water is so essential for our own lives, even in the midst of our own abundance, even in the midst of rainy days, 40 days and more. This living water is manifest as reconciliation and healing, as love, community, freedom, peace. Do we believe in the reality of these things or do we only hear those words and think of pie in the sky ideals? Do we believe in our hearts that God means for us to receive these gifts, each one of us a sinner and yet also a beloved child of God? And do we understand the power of these gifts in our lives? Can we imagine 
the positive potential to change the world if we dare accept these gifts and put them to work for humankind and all creation. Do accept our role in co-creating and sharing these gifts throughout our lives, at home or in school, at work or in the church, or everywhere beyond these walls. Do we ourselves know the gift from God? The second question flows from this. Do we know who it is that stands before us offering God's gracious and many-faceted gift of living water? Do we recognize the risen Christ among us? We know from our baptismal promises that we're supposed to be on the lookout for him, seeking Christ in all others. How often do we encounter him in someone that we least expect that really quiet coworker who never speaks up, or the angry activist who's constantly pushing for change? Could it be the older family member we've tuned out for years? Or how about the stranger whose face and ways are so different from our own, our own Samaritan woman? How about our enemy? How about our child? This story reminds us that Jesus breaks all the rules, breaks down the well-worn and comfortable patterns of our lives, and reaches out from new places to get our attention. And so we need to be alert and aware and anticipating that this is going to happen. We need to be listening to be able to discern his voice and his invitation and his movement in so many ways throughout our lives. Is the Lord among us or not? Yes, he is. The Holy Spirit permeates everything we know. The final question is this, if we know God's gift and the one who bears that gift, who stands as close to us as our own heart, will we ask for the life-giving water being offered to us? Will we open our hands and ourselves to receive it? Will we open our lives to the grace of God to be changed, to be healed, to be made whole, to be brought into the community of believers? And if our answer to these questions is, yes, I will, with God's help, then will we do what the Samaritan woman did when she began to receive the gift of Christ? Will we run to others and say with conviction, come and see the one I have met? Can this be the one we have awaited for so long? Come and see.